1955, a young doctor named E. Donal Thomas became intrigued by the notion of bone marrow transplantation in humans. With funding from the Atomic Energy Commission, which was interested in finding a cure for people exposed to nuclear radiation, he set up a laboratory at the Mary Imogene Bassett Hospital in Cooperstown, New York. There, he and Dr. Joseph Farabee began experimenting with bone marrow transplants in humans with advanced leukemia. Three years later, an accident at the Vincha nuclear reactor just outside Belgrade, Yugoslavia, exposed six workers to very high doses of radiation. One died, and the remaining five were transported to Paris, where Dr. Georges Maté transplanted them with bone marrow collected from five strangers who volunteered to help. At the time, it was not understood that the donor needed to be a genetic match for the patient in order for the transplant to succeed. Although all five patients survived, later analysis cast doubt on whether their survival was actually due to the transplanted bone marrow. In 1957, Dr. Thomas issued a report on the first group of patients he treated with high-dose radiation and a bone marrow transplant in Cooperstown, New York. The results were disappointing. All had died within 100 days of their transplant. Discouraged by these results, Many scientists abandoned interest in human bone marrow transplantation, but not everyone. In 1960, a prominent hematologist in Boston named William Damaschek sent two of his young doctors to visit Dr. Thomas in Cooperstown. They spent a week in his laboratory learning how to perform a bone marrow transplant. One of those young doctors was Dr. Robert Kyle. Three years later, after moving to the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, he was asked to consult on a case involving a nine-year-old girl named Nancy King. Nancy suffered from a blood disorder called aplastic anemia, which left her fatigued and unable to fight infection. She was being kept alive with blood transfusions and large dosages of prednisone, but her condition was rapidly deteriorating. While examining her, Dr. Kyle noticed another child in the room and inquired who she was. The prednisone had caused Nancy to have the moon face and weight gain often associated with prednisone, so it wasn't immediately apparent to him that the child was Nancy's twin. Upon learning that the child was an identical twin, Dr. Kyle proposed a bone marrow transplant. Up until this point, the only successful transplants in humans were syngeneic transplants transplants using bone marrow from an identical twin. Dr. Kyle needed to confirm that the two girls were, indeed, identical twins. They took skin from me, a little small section here, and they planted it on my twin sister and then grafted her skin onto me in the same spot. And if that would grow and we, our skin wouldn't be rejected, then they knew uh, definitely that we were identical twins. In 1963, Nancy was transplanted with her sister Bonnie's bone marrow. Today, she is doing well and leading an active life. It was not until 1968 that bone marrow from a sibling who was not an identical twin was successfully transplanted into a patient. This type of transplant is called an allogeneic transplant. The patient was a baby named David who had a rare immune deficiency disease that had taken the life of all 11 male children born on his mother's side of the family. His pediatrician believed that only a transplant could save him and reached out to the famous immunologist, Dr. Robert Good, at the University of Minnesota for help. A new blood test developed by Dr. Fritz Bach at the University of Wisconsin gave Dr. Good the tool he needed to determine if one of David's four sisters could serve as his bone marrow donor. Dr. Getty wants us all at the hospital to be tested for a possible bone marrow transplant to see if we can save your brother's life. Will it hurt? I don't think so. I believe he'll be asleep. Even if it does, I'm going. If I can help David, I will. Me too. Nine-year-old Doreen proved to be the best match. On August 21, 1968, 
David was transplanted with Doreen's marrow. Finally, in December, David returned home to his family just in time for Christmas. David continued to thrive and is alive and well today. Other successful transplants, using marrow from a sibling who was not an identical twin, quickly followed. Despite these successes, only a third of patients who needed a transplant had a brother or sister who could serve as their donor. After many failed attempts, in 1973, the first successful transplants using bone marrow from an unrelated donor were performed. The first one took place in London, England. A two-year-old boy named Simon Bostick was diagnosed with a rare blood disease called chronic granulomatous disorder, or CGD. The same disease had killed his older brother, Andrew, two years earlier. Desperate not to lose another son, the Bostick family began searching for an unrelated bone marrow donor for Simon. His mother began by asking her friends to be tested. Then she was interviewed for an article in the local press. And the, for some reason this was picked up by the national newspapers in the UK and the tabloid press and it became a huge, huge thing. It was front page news, who can save this child? Um, and uh, to cut a long story short, people started going to be tested um, to see whether they had the correct uh, tissue typing, because it was the tissue typing that was incredibly rare. I, was, I had a tissue typing, I think, one in 50,000. So very, very rare tissue typing, uh, very rare tissue type indeed. So, um, and this is what people went in um, over the course of the next few months um, to be tested for, which is a pretty amazing response. On April 13, 1973, a team led by Professor John Hobbs at London's Westminster Children's Hospital transplanted Simon with Joan McFarlane's marrow. Simon's successful transplant encouraged Shirley Nolan, the mother of a child with a rare genetic disease called Wiscott-Aldrich syndrome, to search for an unrelated donor for her son, Anthony. Although a match was never found for him, her efforts led to the creation of the world's first bone marrow donor registry, which was named in his honor. Today, the Anthony Nolan, based in London, boasts more than half a million bone marrow donors. Later that year, a team of doctors at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York, led by Dr. Richard O'Reilly, performed the first unrelated donor transplant in the U.S. on a five-month-old infant named Matthew. Matthew was born with severe combined immune deficiency syndrome and was immediately hospitalized in a sterile environment after birth until a bone marrow donor could be found for him. Five months later, a Danish woman named Liz Larsen was identified as a donor for Matthew through a tissue typing laboratory at Riggs Hospitalet in Copenhagen. Over a period of two years, she donated bone marrow for Matthew on six separate occasions. Finally, he was able to go home with his parents, but died a few years later of a secondary malignancy. Although the results of bone marrow transplantation for patients with immune deficiency diseases were encouraging, success was not coming as easily for patients with malignant diseases, such as leukemia and lymphoma. Dr. Donal Thomas, who had moved his research from Cooperstown to the U.S. Public Health Service Hospital in Seattle, continued testing bone marrow transplants on patients with advanced stage leukemia. Patients were irradiated in an underground bunker at a former military facility, then quickly transported back to the hospital where they were transplanted. Although in several cases the transplant initially seemed successful, most patients died within a few months. Dr. Thomas began exploring the possibility of transplanting patients earlier in the course of their disease. In 1976, a child named Nancy Van Erka was diagnosed with acute myelogenous leukemia on her ninth birthday. Her doctors held out little hope. Then one evening, while sitting in a local diner, Nancy's parents were given a glimmer of hope. My parents went out to eat one night and they looked out the window and the newsstand, they saw the front page of the newspaper and it said that a young girl from our area was one of the first survivors of a bone marrow transplant and they were doing experimental transplants on 
AML um, children with AML at the Hutch. And so my parents brought that to our doctor and asked why he had not suggested it. And he said that he didn't think I would ever get in remission. And if I did, um, I'd only stay there for like four days. My parents um, insisted that my sister be tested and really a miracle. She matched me on all seven antigens. The family flew to Seattle for the transplant. Nancy was one of only two patients on the transplant unit to survive that year. However, a few years later, Dr. Thomas was reporting increasing success in patients transplanted for leukemia. In 1979, his team performed a successful bone marrow transplant for a patient named Laura Graves using marrow from an unrelated donor. The success of that transplant spurred the creation of a U.S. registry of bone marrow donors called the National Marrow Donor Registry. Today, the registry is called Be The Match and includes more than 11 million volunteer donors. Although transplants using bone marrow provided by a related or an unrelated donor were showing promising results, not everyone had access to a compatible donor. In the early 1980s, autologous bone marrow transplants, transplants using marrow from the patient instead of a donor, were tested at several transplant centers for patients with leukemia, lymphoma, and multiple myeloma. It was an option lymphoma patient Steve Bauer embraced in 1983 with little hesitation. I first heard about autologous transplants from my oncologist after seven months of unsuccessful chemo treatments to combat my stage four non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. I did not receive much information about the transplant process since the procedure was so new and there were no other readily available resources. Despite these uncertainties, I made a decision to go for it and knew that that was my best decision to make for an opportunity to beat my cancer. I had proposed to my wife in January before my transplant decision in the summer of 1983. After my transplant was completed in August, we were married that following October of 1983 and have enjoyed 31 years of happy marriage since. Today, more autologous transplants are performed each year than syngeneic and allogeneic transplants combined. In 1985, a young singer named Kyle Roshlo had just returned from a tour in Japan. It was not unusual for her to feel fatigued after a grueling schedule of performances, but this time the fatigue persisted for weeks. After several blood tests and a bone marrow biopsy, Kyle could not believe the news. She had acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Denial. I thought they had the wrong marrow. I was absolutely certain that they'd made a mistake. Doctors at UCLA Medical Center in Los Angeles immediately began searching for a bone marrow donor. But the National Marrow Donor Registry was still in its infancy, and none of its donors were a match. Out of options, the doctors performed an autologous bone marrow transplant on Kyle instead. The transplant brought her 18 months of good health before the leukemia returned. Once again, doctors launched a search for an unrelated donor. This time, she got lucky. A few months earlier, an employee at a blood bank in Northern California decided to conquer her fear of needles by having a blood test so that she could join the bone marrow registry. She was a perfect match for Kyle. In 1988, Kyle underwent a life-saving bone marrow transplant and is alive and well today. Despite a growing number of volunteer bone marrow donors in the late 1980s, the number of people able to find a suitable donor remained small compared to the need. Dr. Hal Broxmeyer and his colleagues at Indiana University believed that cells in the discarded placenta and umbilical cord of newborn babies could be an alternate source of cells for transplant. In 1988, that theory was put to the test. A five-year-old child in North Carolina named Matthew Farrow was diagnosed with a blood disorder called Fanconi anemia. Unable to find a matching bone marrow donor, 
Dr. Joanne Kurtzberg at Duke University Medical Center in North Carolina proposed an experimental cord blood transplant. The cells would come from Matthew's soon-to-be-born baby sister. The Pharaohs agreed, and arrangements were made for Matthew to have the first-ever cord blood transplant at Hospital Saint-Louis in Paris, France, under the supervision of Dr. Elian Gluckmann, an expert in treating children with Fanconi anemia. He and his parents spoke no French, so his mother created a set of flashcards with pictures to help him communicate what he needed to the hospital staff. I was five years old when um, the time came for my transplant. And uh, I remember actually being frightened, being unaware of what was actually going on, not only to be leaving the country, but also um, the loneliness that I was going to experience being in the hospital without my parents. After six months, the Farrow family returned home and Matthew was finally able to enjoy normal childhood activities without taking extraordinary measures to guard against infection. Today, Matthew works at a cord blood bank, where he helps recruit cord blood donors and counsels patients about this life-saving treatment. By 1990, the number of transplants performed annually had grown to 11,000, yet little information was available to patients, written in simple language, that explained to them what to expect. Transplant survivor Susan Stewart launched BMT InfoNet to address that need. The reason that I started BMT InfoNet was because at the time of my transplant, there was no information available to the layperson about what to expect before, during, or after transplant. So we began as a newsletter and eventually expanded into offering books about transplantation, which are now used at most of the leading medical centers, as well as a peer support program that connects people who are about to go through transplant with someone who's already been through transplant and explains from the patient's perspective what to expect. Since the early days of transplantation, many advances have made this life-saving therapy available to more and more patients. Pioneering work by Dr. George Santos at Johns Hopkins University Medical Center in Baltimore now allows doctors to prepare many patients for transplant with chemotherapy instead of the more toxic total body irradiation. The advent of DNA technology has enabled doctors to more precisely match potential donors with patients. And transplants are now performed not only with bone marrow and umbilical cord blood, but with cells collected directly from the bloodstream as well. A new type of transplant, called non-myeloablative or reduced intensity transplant, allows doctors to prepare patients for transplant with milder, less toxic dosages of chemotherapy. This less intensive pretreatment makes it possible for older patients and those with other health issues to consider a transplant and for much of the procedure to be performed in an outpatient clinic. New research also offers hope for some patients, like African Americans and those of Asian descent, who still struggle to find a compatible donor. Haploidentical, or half-matched, transplants can now be performed using cells from any first-degree relative, a parent, a sibling, or the patient's child. He had a transplant from his dad, but that was the only choice. It was because he didn't match anybody else. We were it. It was mom or dad, and between the two of us, his dad was a closer match, not a match but a closer match, and that was just a chance we were willing to take, so we went with his dad. But challenges, like graft-versus-host disease, which occurs in approximately 50% of patients who undergo an allogeneic transplant, still remain. For some patients, the transplant is only a short-term cure. And the long-term effects of transplant on a patient's quality of life are only now beginning to be addressed. The BMT Clinical Trials Network, a consortium of leading transplant centers, is conducting research to address these and many other transplant issues. Through the partnership of doctors, 
and patients who take part in these clinical trials, we are rapidly learning how to make transplants safer and more effective so that many more people have the opportunity to celebrate a second chance at life.